Good evening. Welcome to the Monday, July 8th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. We have the roll call from the clerk, please. Chairman Garvin? Here. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Randall? Here. And Councilor Straw? Here. Thank you very much. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll start off with the reports and correspondence. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to bring up or mention? Councilor I I think we all received the, I wasn't sure if it was uh, a phishing email or a real email from the White House. Did any oh. of it? <laughs> I'm still not positive that that was real or not, but uh, if anyone cares, uh, the- I think it was real. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So there was some email from the White House inviting, it sounds like all, most of us, down to the White House to meet with some regional director or someone about uh, expressing the issues and concerns that affect our local municipality. Um, so we all received that. I don't know if anyone's planning on going to it or, okay, well, so we received it. <laughs> Um, yeah, d just to expand on what Chris said, uh, part of 13, I think it was 10 or 13 regional uh, meetings of state and municipal leaders and to talk about things that are important to their areas and regions and things like that. So, um, any other reports or correspondence from anybody? Councilor I, Jordan? I just have a general question where this would fit on the agenda, and that's the um, email and communication we received from Gary Cummings regarding. Um, short-term rentals, where are we going to fit that in? Because I think it's just like the second or third time he's corresponded with us, and I think we need to at some point respond. I think we're going to hear from him momentarily oh, in the opportunity is, for discussion of items not there? on the agenda. So um, I'm guessing we will, but um, so probably tonight. Okay, that cool. An Good. Any other reports or correspondence from anybody? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the Finance Committee report. Councilor Straw? Uh, so you should all have the appropriation control, the expense distribution, the revenue control, and the revenue distribution, as well as the uh, financial dashboard. Uh, my understanding is that town manager is going to give us a little bit of an update on also what's been going on with the fort. Uh, one thing I wanted to note with respect to the documents this month is we've now uh, closed out our fiscal year, and uh, I was ple uh, pleased to report, as you may have seen in the, the uh, documents, that we exceeded our revenue expectations and we came in below our expense expectations, which is always a great situation to be in. Um, I would point out that if my workload permits it otherwise, and it also works with uh, the town manager and the finance director and uh, as we're about to enter the audit season, I'm hoping to sit down and go through, now that we've closed out our books, and kind of look at the numbers and see, okay, what can we glean from this and what else can we point out? And then in conjunction with that, uh, look at what our expectations were for revenue in light of uh, the finalized local revenue sharing from the state as well as the finalized numbers for the school and just give you an update on how that all will play out. Um, anyone have any questions on any of that? I think that sounds like a good plan. Um, also, I've been wanting to get in touch with you and Matt about making sure that we continue with our um, sort of regular cadence of subcommittee meetings uh, with the folks from over on the school side. So I know that a lot of that energy and effort was focused towards um, working through the budget season, um, but I think it's productive time well spent uh, for us to continue that even outside of the budget season. I know particularly on the school side, schedules can be a little bit more challenging, but um, look to connect with both of you on that and keep that moving forward. So, Any other questions for Chris? Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, if there are any citizens that want to speak to something that's not on tonight's agenda, now is your opportunity to do so. Please come forward to the podium, give us your name and address or affiliation, and we ask that you limit your comments to about three minutes, please. Hi, I'm Susan Payne, and I live at 72 Stony Brook Road in Cape Elizabeth. I'm here as a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby, and I'm representing two of my colleagues who live in Cape Elizabeth who can't be here tonight, Nina and Robbie Trowbridge. 
We came to talk with you in June about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So we're just back to follow up on that. And we wanted to thank you for letting us pre present and describe the act in June. We met with members of the Energy Committee to talk more about this act, which is an act before Congress that would put a price on carbon and return the money to Americans as a way of promoting the reduction of carbon emissions in a revenue neutral way. The Energy Committee, we were very grateful, supported the recommendation that the Town Council endorse this act. And I'd like to thank the councillors that we were able to meet with. I think we met with almost all of the councillors and talked about this act and were able to answer your questions. So basically, I'm just here to thank you for your time and your effort and your attention and to urge you to join the seven other towns and cities in Maine that have already endorsed this act. We really think it's an effective and fair way to help us meet our the challenge of reducing carbon emissions. And I would just give one update since we were here before. Since we were here before, the US Con Conference of Mayors has also passed a resolution uh, urging Congress to pass this act. So I'm here, I can answer questions if you want. Uh, any follow-up questions? Thank you very much. I think we are gonna discuss this as part of the agenda okay. in just a little bit. Okay, but fine. appreciate your comments now. Okay, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak to something not on tonight's agenda, please come forward. Thanks. Hello, my name is Tim Hebda. I'm at 55 Richmond Terrace, and we'll be um, speaking to you about short-term rentals. Um, if you'd like me to sit down and wait for the agenda, then... Thanks. Nope, this is not on our agenda, so yep, this is the right time. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to speak for a few moments and shed a little bit of light, a little bit of light of what's happening in our very small neighborhood currently. We have four residents in um, our, our small space uh, that are servicing themselves as short-term rentals. Um, we're poised to have two more additional short-term rentals, perhaps uh, as people are aging out of their homes and selling. So they bring our uh, small neighborhood to six properties that are short-term rentals. Um, currently, the four rentals that are being advertised as short-term rentals, um, each state that they sleep six people, um, some very small, some uh, medium-sized uh, dwellings, uh, but that would bring the residents on any given night up to 24 uh, individuals in our, our small neighborhood. So quick uh, count on the fingers and toes, 24 on any given night, 24 uh, individuals on the road would be short-term rentals, Well, 12 would be full-time residents. Um, and it feels to us that we can't establish or maintain a community with that kind of turnover, especially during the summer months. Some of those, um, you know, it's, I think it's supposed to be seven days, but there's two, three day turnovers on some of these properties. Uh, and it certainly can't be a community with that happening. About 10 years ago, I came uh, to this space to ask for a variance to build a second floor onto our house. Um, we were an inch too close to one of our lines and um, there was a strong uh, pushback um, to maintain the community of our neighborhood because of where it was, we couldn't build a second floor because adding that would really change the essence of the community. And that was great, those are the rules, fantastic. Um, and, and we remodeled our, our, our small first floor home. And it works great for us now, but there was a time where that community aspect was so important that a, a, a less than an inch was, was something that the zoning committee could really fall down on. And uh, there's really strict rules about that, and it's fantastic, but um, there are parts of the rules and regulations that aren't as strict or aren't as um, clear. Uh, and that's something that the community is growing with and something that we hope through our conversation can shed some light on it. Um, currently, the uh, Airbnb and the uh, VRBO owners, when they put images of their properties online, it's of the road and of the beach. Uh, but not of the properties until you scroll through a number of those images. Um, so it seems like they're marketing our neighborhood. Um, and uh, looking at the prices that are advertised, it's good for them, but those four properties can pull in uh, $1,200 a night, um, which is fantastic. It's a business that they run in our neighborhood. Um, if I were to ask to run a cafe out of my kitchen, if I were to ask to run a, there's plenty of baseball cards in my house, a baseball card shop out of my driveway, there might be some issues with that, but the difference would be that I'd be on the property. Um, the folks who are running these properties aren't there. So that turnover of 24, up to 24 individuals a night, um, there's no one there to, to monitor that. Um, so I just wanted to bring that, that part to light and, uh, and hope that you can take that um, forward and, and think about it a little bit. 
So I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Are there others that want to make comments for something not on the agenda tonight? Hi, my name is Barbara Cummings. I'm probably going to say the same things basically that Tim has just said. Um, we've lived on Richmond Terrace, well, Gary for his whole life, and I've been there for 47 years. Family neighborhood, very small homes, ranches, um, small capes. Um, as the neighborhood's gotten older and folks have moved on um, to nursing homes or whatever, people are buying the properties just to have for rental properties. They don't live in the neighborhood. They don't live in the houses. They have people come in to clean between um, people that are renting to do the lawn. So it's not only that they bring in a lot of different people to the neighborhood, but there's all the workmen and everything that goes with that. So they come in and they have, you know, supposedly six places that they can stay in the homes, but then they have company and their company brings their friends and now all of a sudden we've got 50, 60 people walking back, back and forth on the road. I realize people have a right to, you know, some extra income. Anyone can appreciate that. But they have no ownership of the neighborhood. And it's really changed the neighborhood from a family neighborhood to basically um, rental units. And I still don't understand how is it that someone can have a, a home and be making money from it and making a profit and it's not considered a business. I don't. I don't understand that. And I thought that if there were business zones for certain uses, that's what was allowed. This is a residential neighborhood. And anything, it affects so few, few of us in town because it seems to be concentrated in areas that are near the beaches and um, Two Light State Park and Fort Williams that it really affects. So most of the people you talk to will say, well, I don't see it's a big deal. People are just trying to pay for their taxes but they're not living in one of these neighborhoods where we have this huge influx of people. Now we do have people in the neighborhood that have bought the homes for summer homes. They come in the summer, their families come in the summer. They're not making a profit, they have some ownership of the neighborhood and it's a totally different um, group of people that are in. So, you know, like this last week, there were a few people that had weddings going on and there's just, there's so many people in the neighborhood and people are making a lot of money. Um, one of the gals across the street gets 4.30 a night. Um, this is, if you saw the neighborhood, it's little ranches and little capes. Um, it, it's not, you know, anything substantial. So I don't know what the process is for re-looking at the ordinance. I know South Portland re-looked at theirs and they have a, um, Apparently, an owner has to live in the residence at some point. I don't know all the, the technical things. I've got them written down, but I'll say them wrong if I try to say them. So anyways, I don't know what the process is, but if you would please look at this again and give us a chance to give you statistics on how many people are coming and going that are abusing the regulations as to how many can stay in the homes and you know whether it's a nightly rental or a weekly rental, one or the other, it's not supposed to be, and they're still doing it, and we're the only ones that see that. So I appreciate your time and hopefully we can work on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else wishing to address the council on something not on the agenda? I'm going to get to questions in a second. Hold on. Is this still on short-term rentals? No. Okay. That's all right. Come on up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Tom Myers. I live for Seaview Avenue. I just um, wanted to um, change the sub subject. Um, I just wanted to thank the uh, town council, the um, staff, as well as the conservation committee for their helpfulness. It's just been, um, we're one day shy of three weeks since the management plan's been in effect at Cliff House Beach. Um, the chief, uh, Chief Fenton and his officers have been marvelous in their responsiveness. Um, they had some in, um, enhanced enforcement activity down there at the beginning of the period, and they've been um, still continuing to do that. Um, I can tell you it's a little awkward. Um, I feel like the grizzled curmudgeon sometimes um, having to um, go down and mention to your um, neighbors who may or may not be aware of the new rules concerning dogs during certain times of the day. And it's been um, comforting to know that the police chief, and by name his Chief Fenton, of course, has asked us to report directly to his officers to call dispatch and ask them to respond and to a 
to a incident that uh, we have known about or called about the police have been very responsive and timely and able to um, uh, educate the folks that are down there to what the new rules might be. Um, I can also tell you that it's a little uncomfortable when you just kindly mention to folks um, before they head down that way with their um, dog that you know the, there's please read the sign. It's also sort of uncomfortable to ask folks if they saw the sign, and you know, it's if if I were to if I okay if I'm on a path and the sign is like right here, and it says dog rules in big letters, and it's like right there. I'm, I can only guess at what the police officers are saying. I, I'm probably a little less kind, but any, in any case, I just, the main point is thank you so much for your attentiveness to this, and thank you to Chief Fenton for his support, and know that the neighborhood and the friends that are down there are going to be relentless, and he's going to have to shut us off um, because we're, we spent a lot of time doing this with you and took some time to get it done, and we're going to continue to ask for that helpfulness from them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the feedback. Anybody else wishing to address the council? Seeing none, uh, I want to come back around to the comments that were made about short-term rentals. Um, Councilor Straw, did you have a question? I was just going to note, if there were more comments on it, that the comprehensive plan discussion, in many ways, it falls under the umbrella of the comprehensive plan. But since there are no more comments. To a degree, certainly. Um, other questions or comments people want to raise in response to what was addressed? I have a couple if nobody else does. But um, Would either of the speakers mind coming back up? Um, I'm just curious, have you or any of your neighbors, um, there is a process for raising complaints or concerns that, that the existing ordinances are not being adhered to? Have, have you or your neighbors uh, made any such filings or anything like that? Um, we've had occasion where they're not supposed to be parked in the road. You know, it's, it's a really fine line. You have neighbors here that are doing this. If you complain on people so many times, then they lose their right to do that. So you kind of try to temper that and speak to the people that are coming there um, to park. But I know my husband writes letters. As far as uh, lodging a, a formal complaint yet, we haven't done that. Things have seemed to really built up this summer um, because it's, there's so much more of it going on. Um, I think that the neighbors are getting upset enough that they, we will start doing that. But uh, to my knowledge, no one's lodged a formal complaint yet. OK. And so, would you say the same for you? So um, the existing ordinance has provisions for filing complaints with the code enforcement officer. Um, and then there's a escalating um, sort of response measurement protocol for him to follow in terms of, it's, it's kind of like a three strikes policy. So I don't know if that's what you're referring to with, if you complain enough, then they lose their right to do it. But um, I, would, I, I would strongly suggest that you take advantage of the instrument that's available to you in terms of reaching out to the code enforcement officer um, to make him aware of the properties that you're concerned about. Um, and if, if there are actual violations going on, then that's what the ordinance is there for, to, to manage that activity responsibly. And, well, and the, I will say the only thing at this point that, um, and you hate to do this kind of thing, but my husband has been keeping track of the license plates mm -hmm. at one of these homes and has furnished them to um, the office today of one house in particular that is having people there nightly. Um, and to, to prove that, that was the only way we could think of right. that that would be. So, I mean, I think it's, it, my main concern is, why isn't this considered a business in a residential neighborhood? Well, it's a permitted use based on the current ordinance. So even though it's defined as a residential area, it's as, as, as the current ordinance is written and, and constructed, it's, it's a permitted use just like there are other 
light business uses like an in-home daycare or other things like that that would be permitted in certain residential areas. So I, I get that you might not agree with that, but that's how, that's how the ordinance is currently constructed. Um, my only point about directing you to the code enforcement officer is there's no way to really know if the provisions of the ordinance that were specifically drawn up to deal with these issues of non-compliance, there's no way to really know if that is working unless that's being exercised as it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if the code enforcement officer isn't being made aware of the fact that there's potential violations going on and then investigating the violations and recording them if, if there in fact are, then we don't, we don't know if that behavior will change because no enforcement's taking place. Does that, does that make sense? It does, but what, what are the steps that need to be taken for um, the ordinance to be looked at as South Portland's was and ha maybe have some changes made? I will say that if the owners, I can think of three of the places, had to live in the home, they wouldn't be doing it. Uh, this is only for a for-profit business and they're making a lot of money. And I know some people have in-home businesses, but the, the traffic that's generated between all the work people and their guests and all the people. It's a, it's a private dirt road. It's a very fragile road with all this traffic on it. Now, we pay for our own maintenance. Um, we have a, um, because the state park came in and took land all around where we live, they um, very nicely gave us a deeded right of way to the beach because it only affected the neighborhood. Now, the way it reads is that it's for um, residents and guests only. These are paying customers. The homeowners know that, and they are still doing that, and it's abusing one of the rights that we have. Now, I know a lot of the neighborhoods do not have that, that issue, and I realize that that isn't the issue here. I guess what I'm saying is, what do we have to do to relook at this issue as South Portland did? I understand that we need to get our eggs all in a row, and we need to all start keeping tracks of the abuses that are going on so that we can come up here and say this and this and this and this happened. Um, but we're just, it's, we just really need some help here. Just one second, Councilor. Yeah. I, I would just say that before anybody looks at changing any of the existing ordinance, mm -hmm. the first thing I would want to do, and I would speak on behalf of everybody here, but the first thing I would want to do is know that whatever provisions for compliance and regulation that we have in place already, that they're in some way broken mm -hmm. and without actually, like I said, sort of exercising mm -hmm. that compliance, we have no way of really knowing that. Okay. So I would, as a, just a first step, and it's not to say that there wouldn't be subsequent steps after that, mm -hmm. but as a first step, I think we really need to make sure that those aspects of the ordinance are, are being enforced as they should mm -hmm. and part of that is a reporting mechanism on the on the part of homeowners in a neighborhood like yours to say hey there's there's you know out of compliance activity going on here mm -hmm. you need to do something about it because that's exactly why it was written into the into the ordinance like that mm -hmm. and i would just say that while the problem may have gotten worse i mean i know that the ordinance i think it was 2014 um, was when we were last reported on on this and 2012 is when the ordinance went into effect so I, I imagine the activity has probably changed in the last five years, but mm -hmm. the way the ordinance was written and, and um, passed was part of a really, really lengthy um, effort to bring together stakeholders on all sides of the issues to try and strike what seemed like a balanced compromise at the time. So the conditions may have changed such that that no longer holds true. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But... Um, in, in the sense of not wanting to throw sort of the baby out with the bathwater, I would want to not dismiss all of that time and effort that went into achieving that balance and compromise. Again, if, if we haven't done the due diligence on making sure that um, enforcement and exercise of, of 
of the activity is taking place. Councilor Straw. So I'm going to reiterate uh, much of what uh, Chairman Garvin said uh, and hopefully provide a little more clarity um, and also give some clarity to the comment I made prior. Uh, so tonight, later on our agenda, we're discussing the comprehensive plan, right. uh, which discusses how we want our town to evolve over the next 10 years. One of the items that's in there is what do we do about short-term rentals? The original draft uh, had language that, from my perspective, was very, very um, uh, permissive towards short-term rentals. We've uh, altered that in the current draft no longer has the language that I personally, I, I am in favor of drastically restricting short-term rentals, just get that out there. So it's now much more vague. So it falls under the umbrella of uh, the comprehensive plan from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So to your question of how do you get the ordinance changed, once we pass or don't pass the comprehensive plan, I, um, at that point, then we would look at the comprehensive plan, mm -hmm. in, I assume, and in conjunction with that, say let's update our short-term rental rules to bring them into compliance with the new comprehensive plan. And at that point, uh, we would begin looking at, okay, do we require someone to be in the property or can they rent if they're not on the property, things like that, like you point out. Mm -hmm. uh, but a key aspect as part of the discussion with the comprehensive plan, we were hearing the feedback was there haven't been a lot of complaints. Okay. So it's really important that, you, that you're that you coming in and telling us this. It's also really important, and I know it stinks and you don't want to be like, I don't want to complain about my neighbor, you know, we want to have good be on good terms and you know they're doing this I just I wish they just rein themselves in without me having to complain to the town but absent the complaint to the town we don't know what's going on mm -hmm. and then when we say to the code enforcement officer oh have you had any complaints and he says oh I've only had one then we don't know that it's a problem so I would just say if we, we need to hear feedback so I appreciate okay. you coming and sharing this with we us. We will definitely yeah. do that um, and I appreciate the input and also your advice um, we at the press time have two one house that was just recently sold and we have another vacant house in the neighborhood and what's what's going to happen with one of them is it will be another Airbnb so the, you know the prices that people are asking for the houses people can make a lot of money of so we will go back to the drawing board and get our eggs all in a basket and come back. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Just, both of you are kind of asking them to complain and complain, but there could be nothing to complain about. I mean, they could be doing everything right, everything according to the rules, and it's still a problem, right? right. Like, regardless of the every night, even if it's every week, you're, the, the issue is not violating the ordinance. The issue is perhaps the ordinance, which is why she was asking to look at the ordinance again, not so much, you know, deal with the violations, but to look at it again. So that's Good where point. Chris's comments come in. That's what I was going to say is yep. we need to get this comp plan passed so that we can have that window that says, oh, we can look at this again now, I would think is the best way to go about. And that doesn't require any complaints, right? Because there could be nothing wrong and we still want to maybe rein those ordinances back in. Thank you, Councillor. I don't disagree with you. I, I, I think the two things that I heard most directly from what's been brought forward to us tonight relate to parking and um, uh, insufficient uh, waiting time between turnover. Those are the two things I heard, which would both be in violation of the ordinance. So, What I heard was just in general, they don't want short-term rentals in their neighborhood. That's regardless of whether there was a single parking violation or a single one night thing, like even if everything was followed by the book, it's still a problem, correct? Right. So those were just two incidents. The overall problem that they came to complain about was short-term rentals, not a couple violations of short-term rentals, but of short-term rentals. Right. Yeah. Okay. Councilor uh, Penny Jordan. I agree with uh, Chris that comp plan is the avenue to take, but I also, uh, Barbara, I, I hear what you're saying. It's changing the essence of a neighborhood. And I think that through our comprehensive planning and work that we do, it's my understanding that a council person can, can sponsor uh, a uh, a look at an ordinance because what, you've got a beautiful neighborhood, lots of access. Of course, if I bought a house there and I was investing in something, why wouldn't I go there? So what you're bringing up to me is um, Richmond Terrace is an example of what can happen to many neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth, exactly. and that's what we need to look at. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. 
Your name and uh, limit your comments to about three minutes, please. 36 Richmond Terrace. I did speak to Ben about, I don't know, four or five days ago, and uh, actually a week and a half ago, and I did keep a record. He mentioned about the seven day window, and this one particular house had three groups of different cars, which I assume were tenants. And this ordinance that you have right now is very difficult to enforce. He told me, he says, you, you go on the internet and look for reviews, and if there's more than one good review, then you kind of assume that they might have more than one tenant, and you go speak to them. Well, you're going to have some teeth in this ordinance, you know? So that's why I said, so important, step into the plate, they put an ordinance that kind of protects the neighborhoods and keeps them like all neighborhoods. That's all we want is the neighborhoods like Oakhurst Road, you know, the park, wherever. And uh, it's getting out of hand. The internet, is, these businesses are just expanding, and Airbnb, these people can make fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 renting a house in a year. You know, who wouldn't do it? And they walk down the street with alcoholic beverages and stuff like that. It's not a big violation. All neighborhoods have that. I look the other way. There are violations. I don't report them. I usually take care of my business myself. I don't need to involve a hundred other people. But now I'm asking the council to consider some changes to kind of keep the neighborhood somewhat uh, like all neighborhoods should be. Okay, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address something not on tonight's agenda? Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. if it would be helpful to the council, what I'd like to do in uh, advance of next month's meeting is to get some data from the code enforcement officer as far as complaints, the number of uh, short-term rentals that we do have, how it's grown, because I do think it's grown since the last time the council may have reviewed that. Uh, as, as Mr. Cummings and Mrs. Cummings both said, they've... Uh, They've seen it. Uh, there's a couple of different pockets, I guess, ultimately in town that have seen some of these conversions take place more so than in other neighborhoods. So what they're feeling is is more acute than it may be in the larger picture. But uh, I know from working with Ben that it's growing, and you know a good portion of his permits that he has to process now are short-term rentals, and and just monitoring that is is really becoming more and more of a of a part of his job, uh, more so than. It was originally, so I can get, you know, can work with them to get some data to come back for a report to the council, and that may be helpful in order to advance the ball further. And then uh, you can have that in advance of discussion with the comprehensive plan process as well, so you can have that for uh, for information to help you decide which direction to go in. To, um, thank you. Um, to the the point that. Um, Mr. Myers made earlier about around the dog ordinance and having neighbors reporting on neighbors as violations too. Um, if you could ask Ben to take a look at what other communities are doing around compliance, um, I'd, I'd really like to have a better understanding about how we could craft an ordinance that doesn't rely on neighbors reporting yeah. on neighbors where they may or may not even know that there's a violation to report. Um, Will do. Anybody else on this? Okay. We'll move on to the town manager's monthly report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the understatement of the week, summer is definitely in full swing. Uh, glad we had that two hot days. But with the great weather and the increased tourism, traffic has also markedly increased. Our local police force is responding to speeding and other traffic complaints from town residents. And... Uh, as, as uh, has been said before, please don't take the matter into your own hands. We do have good professionals who are trained for that, so please uh, reach out to them, and we are happy to respond uh, to those complaints and concerns. Uh, the other uh, big secret is that on July 1st, we began the pay and display program at Fort Williams Park, and the first week was a success. The park experienced a high volume of visitors. Uh, <coughs> last week with the parking lots heavily subscribed daily. Staff observations are that the use of the pay and display meters was adopted quickly. Uh, I noticed on my first hand with uh, my multiple trips to the fort over the past week to, to, to monitor and see how things were going. Here's the good news. I am pleased to report that the first week of meter gross revenues was $33,214. As the program continues, I will look to provide a greater detailed breakdown of the revenues. 
such as number of season passes, all day fares, and hourly fares. Next month's financial dashboard will begin to track these revenues on a monthly basis, and this program has also increased local subscription to using the recycling center decals. <laughs> Councillor Straw, I know you'd be happy to hear that. Uh, which residents can pick up at the police department and at the recycling center. I'd like to express my thanks for the efforts of Kathy Raftis at Community Services, Bob Malley, Public Works Director, Cape Elizabeth Police Department, Deborah Lane, our Assistant Town Manager, and our Park Rangers, Greeters, and Parks Crew for all of their efforts in assisting the program start. In the same discussion of municipal revenues, I have an updated amount to anticipate for state revenue sharing. The budget anticipated revenue sharing in the amount of $475,000, but as you may know, the legislature was not done with their work at that point. Uh, the most recent state approved budget now has the updated amount coming to the town in the amount of $582,180. So those are two good things to report this evening. On the legal front, Surfside Avenue case is scheduled to begin on July 22nd in Portland. The town planner, code enforcement officer, and myself are named as potential witnesses and we will be uh, available in the court for that week. Please be advised that the try for a cure is this coming Sunday. And in between the hours of 6 a.m. and 11 a.m., traffic may be adversely impacted due to the presence of cyclists in the try. Please plan your travel accordingly. We will be locating the electronic message board in the town center to remind residents of the event. And as we will not be meeting before the Beach to Beacon comes, I'm here to remind you also that on August 3rd, the Beach to Beacon is planned and traffic will be heavily impacted in the town center from 6 a.m. to noon, as well as the Thursday and the Friday leading up to it. So please be, be advised. Um, we will have signage installed long before the event and you will see the signage coming up to remind folks uh, that that day is coming. So uh, that's all I have to report this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you very much, Matt. Any questions for the manager, Councilor Straw? Uh, thank you very much for that information. I just wanted to, my recollection is the proposal we had from the parking vendor, and obviously it was 4th of July weekend, a little off was that we were gonna be pulling in approximately 4,000 a day. So we're running about 110% of what was anticipated. So we're exceeding revenue expectations. Yeah. But obviously first week and 4th of July, so. It was interesting to see how the numbers ramped up. Uh, yeah. Day one, of course, was, uh, was a challenge. We pulled in about 1,100 bucks on that day as things were getting up to speed and, and coming on board. Uh, but the next day we were looking at 3,500, then it went to 45, and then the fourth and the fifth were, were big numbers. Hmm. And then, but their normal weekend days, you're probably looking at weekends, you're probably in the five, five to six thousand dollar range and then on the during the week you're probably in the four thousand range so i think their estimates were, were were spot on we did install you know as as you go through this you uh you move on the fly uh we put in some additional additional meters to make it more easy for people to to do what they need to do because people were queuing up to to pay so we had some more in, in a little bit more areas that was easier for folks to get to and and make their payment but you know we're down spoke with people uh on a you know, different basis, uh, you know, I'll tell you, we were heavily subscribed from a lot of out-of-staters, like on like the 75 plus percent visit rate last week. Uh, but they were like, thank you, this is fine. You know, you guys are keeping, keeping this park up great and this is our, our way to help out. So it was a good first week. Were, were the numbers, um, were there more people than usual or was it our regular numbers? Did he say? Uh, based on, because I've been, I mean, I'm, I'm down there a lot. Uh, June was really heavily subscribed as well. Uh, we're, we're, there's just a large volume that's in the park. And, uh, but interestingly, people are all going into the pay and display lots. We have some who are back and the, the, the free areas are being used by uh, people who want to use them. And, uh, but you know, the premier parking is where people are, are fine to pay and the rate's reasonable. Any other questions for Matt? Seeing none, next up is a review of the draft minutes of the meeting of June 10th, 2019. Looking for a motion to approve the minutes as presented in the packet tonight. So moved. Councilor Gabrielson, is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Next up, we're going to have a um, presentation as we talked about earlier. Um, uh, Peter Monroe's here tonight to tell us more about the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Um, just as a way of, by way of introduction, I attended the Energy Committee meeting last month uh, where they were um, briefed on this and 
uh, the Energy Committee forwarded to us a uh, unanimous recommendation uh, that we should sign on to this and endorse it. But um, Mr. Monroe, do you want to come forward? So I'm Peter Monroe from 32 May Street in Portland, <laughs> formerly of Cape Elizabeth. Um, do you want me to just give a brief outline? That'd of be the... great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm a member of citizen of the Portland chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, which is a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is working to get Congress as a whole and this administration to adopt a rising price on carbon, returning all proceeds to all Americans in order to begin to stabilize the climate, which is driven by our carbon emissions, and to uh, shield low and middle uh, income people from the cost, the rising costs of products based on fossil fuels. Um, I am not an economist, I am not a scientist, I am not a member of the Pentagon, but experts in all those areas have said this policy is effective, it will drive down emissions by over 30 percent by 2030, um, which will be in line with our Paris objectives, in fact it will exceed our Paris objectives, that it will be good for people um, because it will create many new jobs in clean energy and in fact in other areas like retail and construction and health care where there is a backlog of demand from low and middle income people. And when they're given money, which they don't have to necessarily spend on carbon-based goods, it'll be extra cash that they can use to, to improve their lives. So it will be a very good will. Uh, it'll actually have great social benefits uh, beyond what we can calibrate. Um, it will uh, reduce uh, premature deaths from the pollution that's associated with carbon emissions. It will do a variety of other things. Um, we are asking towns, nonprofits, and um, community activists around the state of Maine to endorse this policy as a way of demonstrating to our members of Congress that there is broad-based constituent understanding of this approach and approval of this approach. And as um, Susan Payne, um, a resident here in Cape Elizabeth, has already indicated, uh, seven or eight other towns, <laughs> including the cities of Portland and Bangor and the, uh, the coastal line communities of Arousic and uh, Final Haven and the inland cities of Winslow, which uh, adopted a, an alternative um, endorsement, um, and others have already voted in this direction. We hope you will do the same tonight. And we're here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions directly from Mr. Monroe? Is there anybody from the public that wishes to comment on this item too? I want to make sure that there's opportunity for public comment. Seeing none. Um, so at this point, uh, take a number of different routes on this. Um, I'm happy to entertain a motion to, this has already been in front of the Energy Committee. Um, I'm happy to entertain a motion to endorse the resolution as presented. Uh, Send it for further consideration, um, whatever the will of the council is. Council Randall. I move that we endorse the resolution as presented. Is there a second? Second. Council Penny Jordan, any discussion? Council Straw. So uh, did the uh, energy, was it the energy or the conservation committee? Energy committee. And did they give us a recommendation at all? They unanimously recommended that right. we sign on to the resolution. Like I said, I was, I was at their meeting and have, I was there for a different reason, but heard the discussion about it, so. Other discussion? Um, the points that I'll bring up that uh, I heard then and will just emphasize for now is that this in no way obligates the town to anything in particular. Um, the real value that the town is providing here if we endorse this is our voice. Um, and I think as we've all heard through review of the comprehensive plan uh, draft in the last several months, along with obviously just other uh, information available to us. As a coastal community, I think this is um, something that should be of paramount concern to us. Um, and uh, I think 
you know, there's a lot of issues that are sort of national or global issues that um, we often sit and wonder, well, what can we as a little community do about this? And I think this is something tangible that we can actually do. Like I said, that the, the value is really in raising our voice on this. So I'm happy to support it. So is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of endorsing the resolution uh, regarding uh, the initiative for uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, next up on the agenda is item number 117-2019, Good Table Liquor License. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, a good table is seeking renewal of their restaurant malt, venice, and spiritus liquor license with no concerns having been reported by the police fire code enforcement officer. Is there a motion to approve? Councillor Caitlin Jordan, what would you like to share? I just actually disclose that my family business does business with the good table. Thank you. Any concerns on that? Seeing none. Councillor Jordan, what would you like to share? I need to disclose that the Good Table is a staunch supporter of Cape Farm Alliance, which I'm a very active member of, and of uh, our strawberry festivals. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Anybody with concerns on that point either? Seeing none. Is there a motion to approve the licensure request? So moved. Councillor Straw, is there a second? Councillor Randall, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's approved. Number 118-2019, uh, CAG Pizza Inc. doing business as Ocean House Pizza and uh, they're seeking a renewal of their liquor license. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this one? Seeing none. Uh, again, having no concerns been reported by the police, fire, and code enforcement officer. <coughs> Business is looking for renewal of the restaurant malt, venice, and spiritus liquor license. Anybody with anything to disclose on this one? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the license? So moved. Councillor Randall, is there a second? Second. Councillor Devereaux. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's approved. Uh, from the June 10th meeting, uh, we have item number 105-2019. Looking for a motion to take that off the table. So moved. Thank you, Council Gabrielson. Is there a second? Council Randall, any discussion? All those in favor? The item is back on the table. Uh, we're now going to have a public hearing on the draft of the comprehensive plan. Uh, if you wish to speak on this, please come forward to the podium, give us your name and address or affiliation, and I'd ask that you please limit your comments to about three minutes. Is there anybody wishing to speak on the draft of the comprehensive plan? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Item number 105-2019, we've been reviewing the draft of the comprehensive plan uh, over the last several months. We held a public hearing uh, last month on June 10th and a public hearing here tonight as well. Uh, it, we're anticipating that we will vote on the draft of the comprehensive plan tonight. Uh, so I'm looking for motion from any councilors. Mr. Chairman, oh, if, if go I ahead. May, uh, yeah, please. Town Planner Maureen O'Mara is here this evening and yeah. there is a segment that she'd like to uh, have amended on the comp plan. So I don't know if Maureen could come up and just briefly advise the council sure. as to, to one edit that needs to be done before the council moves forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just ministerial on page yeah. seven where we talk about the public participation process. I would like authorization to add in the dates of the public hearings that the council has held and also the dates of the workshops you've held. Please do so. Thank you. Anything else? Is there a motion on this item? Uh, I move that the town adopt the comprehensive plan subject to the amendments that Maureen just mentioned um, and submit it to the state for review. Thank you. Moved by Council Gaberson. Is there a second? Councilor Penny Jordan? Discussion. 
Strong. Short and sweet. Uh, so, I, as you know, I'm going to vote no. Um, the uh, I think they did a rel uh, relatively good job. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. I agree with most of it. Uh, but the population, as you know, the population demographic section, I think, needs to be fixed. And uh, the land use uh, section has provisions that I can't agree with. So, for that reason, I'm going to be voting no. Okay. Thank you very much. Other discussion? Seeing none, motion on the floor is to approve the draft of the comprehensive plan and forward that along to the state. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? That passes. Thank you very much. And uh, again, extend my gratitude on behalf of the council to uh, staff and the comprehensive plan, <laughs> plan committee for their diligent work on this. It's uh, a very big task and very valuable one for the town and your work is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Item number 119-2019 is proposed amendments to chapter seven of uh, the dog ordinance. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? My name is still Tom Myers, and I still live at 4 c -view. Um At the risk of sounding like a one-trick pony, which I hopefully is not the case, um, I've been sticking by the um, uh, with staff as well as the ordinance committee through the duration of their review of the dog ordinance and the proposal that's before you tonight. I think the um, conservation committee as well as staff did a really fine job in crafting a, an ordinance that includes a number of provisions, including some enforcement. And I would, in, um, I think, as I've learned in the short three weeks, that the, the, um, the proof is in the pudding when you um, actually uh, put teeth to it and, and try to enforce. And so I would encourage that provision to remain. The other piece that was um, that came up that is for your discussion is the uh, ability of. Uh, dogs to be on athletic fields, and I look forward to um, your di your discussion on that and any information you might have. I, it's my belief that um, the dogs should not be allowed on any of the athletic fields at any time of the year, and for all kinds of reasons, mostly related to health and uh, long-term safety of those athletes and families that are using those uh, fields during the, the, the during the year. Again, the, the key thing is that um, the, uh, another key thing of the provisions of the ordinance is the delegation of the uh, of your authority to the other to the school superintendent as well as the conservation committee to make um, thoughtful, timely, and quick adjustments to the ordinances that might need to take place because of something that crops up that was unanticipated or uh, some behaviors that just all of a sudden pop up. And I think that's a very elegant and, and a wise course. It, it does not eliminate your ability whatsoever to have control over any of the spaces or any, in any of the places that are um, within those um, different um, whatever you call them, control them, but, um, but it also pushes it out to folks that can take timely action in a, in, as experts in that particular area. And I think that's a, a really good option that you should um, gladly take as a, as a way to um, handle some of these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments on this item? Seeing none. Um, so you see before you in the agenda the um, number of meetings that have taken place. Uh, we have all the links to the um, proposed language. Um, is there anybody uh, from the ordinance committee that wants to speak to this at all at this point before entertaining any motion of any kind? I would say that um, number one, the amount of um, public input during this process was, um, from my perspective, well thought out. 
Um, and the work that the Conservation Commission did was um, a lot of the heavy lifting. The essence of the uh, ordinance that um, we went through the, with the property management and um, updates and some of the definitions um, and really uh, that whole property management I think helps to, um, to kind of uh, align some of the uh, dog activity with the, the land, the different areas. But one of the things, and so I'm not sure I can, and how to do this, because I'm not sure I can put forward a motion to uh, accept the uh, ordinance in in total because there needs to be conversation about dogs on athletic fields. So I could put forward the motion that uh, we accept these changes, but then there needs to be a conversation about dogs on athletic fields. So just as a point of order, the first thing we'll need to do is set a public hearing because the ordinance changes and have that. Yeah. So there's no intended action tonight to accept Good. The, and, and implement the ordinance. Okay. Um, so next step would be either having a, having setting a public hearing. Um, we can have a further workshop discussion just amongst the council on this prior to a subsequent meeting. We can do both of those things tonight, set the public hearing for August and schedule a workshop. Um, all of those things are sort of available to us. Councilor Jordan? I was going to say, I, I think look, a conversation of putting something forward about the athletic fields also needs to happen. I don't know if we need a separate workshop for it. I think it's something that we could do either tonight or maybe more appropriately at the public hearing um, after we've heard from people and they had the chance to listen to them. But I agree with Penny. I, at this moment, I would be putting forth uh, something. And then... Uh, Again, we have to put something forward toward the public hearing. So we have to decide, are we putting this to the public hearing or are we putting no dogs on the athletic fields to the public hearing? Because, so I think a conversation has to occur before we can do anything. Councilor Randall. Yeah, and I just wanted to note that one of the issues that came up in our um, ordinance committee meetings was that people felt that they we're perhaps going to be left out of some important discussion. So I think that's all the more reason to discuss it in a full setting like this rather than a workshop meeting where people may not know that that's what's going on. But um, we just wanted to make sure that when it is set for a public hearing that it's abundantly clear to the public that that's, that in particular is what will be discussed. Okay. I'm curious for the uh, members of the subcommittee with respect to the we, we use the phrase as athletic field uh, have you did you hear feedback or, uh, on any field other than the athletic field at Fort Williams or is this all really about the one that abuts the off-leash dog area well I was gonna say it's not just the Fort Williams yep. athletic field it's right. all athletic fields in town yep. that we heard about so so people have uh, brought the issue up with other athletic fields exactly. and dog. okay yes all right to be clear, it would include discussion of the Fort Williams area as well, which was also an issue that people were concerned about. Councilor Gerson. I, I, um, I just want to commend both the Ordinance Committee, Conservation Committee, for, for the work that's gone into crafting this ordinance. I think from my perspective, what this ordinance will do is give us the tools to be able to have those discussions such as what should be the appropriate rules on dogs on athletic fields as those issues come up and, and are developed. I would fully support putting this ordinance as it's written to a public hearing um, in August and that will give us the tools we need to have to have those continued discussions around athletic fields um, to the, the point that Mr. Meyer made earlier, um, you know, it's not just the unforeseen events that this ordinance gives us the opportunity to deal with, it's also foreseen ones. For example, the rules at, at uh, Cliff House Beach have, have a seasonal element to them. Um, and so I think, I think this is a very flexible and, and tool that lays out a good, clear process. And um, I, for one, am ready to move forward with adopting the ordinance 
I'm sure we will have a lot of discussion around athletic fields as part of that um, and probably other issues moving forward. <laughs> Any other discussion? I could just respond yep. briefly. I also held that position because I thought it would be an interesting time for us to try out how it works and make sure that the process actually worked. But Mr. Meyer actually pointed out that this is the time when we're looking at it and we're making these designations. And if we don't agree with what we've put in there, this is the time to change it. So I think to start out on the right foot, it does make sense as a full council to discuss the athletic field issue. Councilor Jordan? So I think I would more prefer, I don't even know if that's proper grammar, but um, to change the designation of the athletic fields on our, what is this, the property management category designation draft, that um, all athletic fields be changed to a number two, which requires them to be on leash. That at least provokes um, change and would get hopefully greater attention and more input from a public hearing that we would have next month. Um, <laughs> As opposed to us just saying, hey, we're going to leave it and and go forward. But I, I'm seriously in the position of that there needs to be no dogs on athletic fields. So I'd be more comfortable putting that forward for the public hearing. And then after we hear from people, if you want to go back to the way it's been, then we can. And uh, that would be your position for year-round or just from like we currently do in Fort Williams from uh, April 1st to November 1st? I mean, I'm not going to oh. go right out and say what. Uh, oh, I'm just saying putting forward to the public hearing, I think it would be a stronger public hearing if we were of the position that, that dogs are going to be banned from athletic fields because that, that's yeah, where I'm at. I attended the Fort Williams um, committee meeting where they did talk about um, this before it came to the ordinance committee. It was very well attended by people uh, from the community who thought that um, dogs were going to have to be on leash. So I think your point's really well taken. And there were quite a few people that spoke about the um, uh, winter season, even though people... Um, there was snow and people had their dogs off leash and some people had them on leash, there were still problems with the athletic field. So, um, because then after everything melts, then you find what the dogs have left. So it was still creating problems even though it was a seasonal ordinance. So I think that your point is um, well taken that maybe we'll get a bigger turnout if we do that. So I just want to recap where we're at right now. So I'm not hearing any interest in having a workshop for the council on this. Exactly. We're looking at setting to a public hearing in August, um, discussion of the ordinances uh, and the changes as presented here with the potential, based on the discussion that's ongoing now, to amend language that is currently mm -hmm. in what's proposed to be what is put forward for the public hearing. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Do you want a motion that does all that? That's why I was trying to <laughs> tee that up. <laughs> so I would move that we set a public hearing for, is it August 12th, 12th um, of amending the dog ordinance that includes amendments to what has been presented that designates all athletic fields to be um, no dogs, category one. And draw me a list, I or could I just leave that to the staff to figure out which one of these p properties, like Playstead right. Park and Lions Field and all of those things that are hidden in there that I'm not jumping out at me, are included as athletic fields? I second that. Moved by Councilor Caitlin Jordan, seconded by Penny. Jordan, is there any discussion? Councilor Straw. So I'm just going to vote yes, but I just want to be clear that this is just, as you noted, to increase interest, it does not mean we're necessarily voting yes at the end of the day on this. Right. But for the purposes of putting it, what's on the public hearing, I'm voting yes. Other discussion? Yeah, I agree with that. I, I don't want the public to be, um, 
sort of overly alarmed uh, to think that action is being taken that hasn't been contemplated or discussed or, or publicly noticed or anything like that. Um, but I would underscore and, and reiterate what uh, I think both Councilor Caitlin Jordan and, and Councilor Randall were saying, that at the public hearing next month, that is the precise issue that I think we are most interested in hearing about up until this point. The other aspects of the ordinance, as best as I can understand, have been pretty well, um, you know, there's been a consensus that's been pretty well formed around those. And the one that's pretty, um, uh, you know, that, that's remaining outstanding is this sensitivity um, to the athletic fields and, and usage um, thereof. So um, if you're either planning to participate in that public hearing or going to communicate with us beforehand, um, we'd love to hear from you about that. I know we've gotten an email just in the time we've been sitting here, actually. So um, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of setting this to the public hearing on August 12th? That's unanimous. Mr. Chairman, yep. if, I, if I may, just to, for a point of order, looking at uh, August 12th's agenda, mm -hmm. is it the council's preference to have the public hearing and then wait until September to have, take action, or would you like that all on the, or, on the agenda for that evening for action? Um, my personal preference would be to have the hearing and then vote in September. Um, okay. I'm seeing Agreed. agreement on that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wanted to make sure before we... Uh, I suspect that this will be one of those things that we get a lot of input on, and um, in those cases, we tend to not vote on the night of the, of the hearing. So. Perfect. We'll make it happen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Next up is item number 120-2019, a request to amend the sewer service area at 38 Broad Cove Road. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak about this? Seeing none, uh, we have a request before us um, to refer this request to the planning board. Uh, the planning board will have its recommendation by the end of August so the town council can hold a public hearing in September. So is there a motion to refer this item to the planning board? So moved. Council Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Council Devereaux, any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Next up is item number 121-2019, Memorandum of Understanding for the Main Reciprocal Borrowing Pilot, Main State Library. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak about this? Uh, we do have uh, Kyle yep. Bowers here this evening as well. Do you want to introduce this for us, Kyle? Thank you for your patience in waiting through everything. Kyle Negabauer, the library director of the Thomas Memorial Library here in town. Um, so statewide shared borrowing, I am told, has been something that has been talked about on various levels in the state for about 40 years now. Um, I haven't been around in Maine that long, so I'm going to take the State Library's word for it on that one. Um, but in the last year, the Maine State Library has really kind of refocused and, and energized their efforts into trying to get something off the ground, um, trying to overcome local control issues, technology issues, um, and how different systems talk to each other. And so where we have come at right now is they've come up with this opt-in pilot program um, that is available to all libraries that can talk to a central system that is um, housed under main infonet, which I know is getting very, very um, inside the beltway. But we are one of those libraries that qualifies for this. Um, it's very similar to the MOU that we already have for shared borrowing with South Portland, Scarborough, Westbrook, and Gorham. It's just kind of taking that concept and applying it on a statewide level. Um, I honestly believe because we're already in a shared borrowing agreement with our two neighboring towns, Scarborough and South Portland, we're not gonna see a huge increase in people coming to us. I think we'll see some. And it's also our geography because of where we are. We don't have people passing through Cape Elizabeth commuting back and forth like other towns might. Um, I think our patrons will have a great time being able to go out to other libraries as they're traveling or, or commuting. And I think we'll have some of that as well. Um, I don't think all of the details are worked out, but it's a pilot project and it's an MOU. Um, and in talking with other librarians and people, I, I really think that this is the direction that libraries need to be going and that uh, it's something that we certainly believe in. And we really wanna be 
at the table when this process is occurring and when the decisions and the feedback is being given so that we can kind of help shape it instead of being outside wondering what are they doing with this pilot. Um, so overall, I, I think it would be very good for us. Thank you, Kyle. Are there questions for Kyle about this? Councilor Devereaux? Are there any costs associated with it? No. Um, so there's no direct cost. I mean, there, there might be some um, minor staff time costs trying to track down a, a, a rogue patron that has lost a book. Um, that's something that we see in our current shared borrowing agreement, in our current um, interlibrary loaning throughout the state. So other than that, I don't foresee any cost. Okay. Is, can I ask, is, yeah. like, what's the downside is that, and why it just hasn't happened or again, you said it's been something that's been talked about for a long time and just hasn't happened. Like, what's the downside? Um, I know a lot of the larger population centers um, throughout the state are nervous about it in that they will be, they will receive a large influx of people from neighboring towns that don't have, the smaller neighboring towns that don't have great libraries. Um, and then they will be carrying the burden of those surrounding towns at the expense of their own patrons who pay taxes in to them directly. Um, given our region and metropolitan where we live, area where we live, I don't think that really applies to us. Um, but I have heard that there's been some significant pushback on that from other places in the state. Um, the technology to have all of the different consortiums and library systems in Maine talk to each other is still not perfect. It's a lot better than it was even five years ago. Um, that is expanding, and so the, the technology was a big hurdle in that. And also the idea of local control um, for each municipality or town has kind of held that back as well. Okay. Councilor Straw. So this really just seems like Minerva, but you can actually go in person. Is yes. That, so there's already that concern about the imbalance of, oh, we have a big inventory of books and people are going to borrow our books, which my kids would say, oh, we've got the Nintendo Switch games and everyone else is borrowing them from Cape. Uh, yes. So it's really just, it's Minerva taken to the next level. Basically, yeah, it's in person. The, the best way, and I should, probably should have said this to begin with, the best way the state library is selling it is saying this is in-person interlibrary loan. Instead of you sitting on your computer at home requesting things from wherever, you can go to the library directly, browse, and check them out. Hans Gaberson. Uh, I'm just curious as a library patron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this also, is this envisioned that you would say I, I'm on vacation in Bar Harbor and they're a participant <laughs> library, I borrow a book from the Bar mm -hmm. Harbor Library directly. Do I return that book in Bar Harbor before I leave on vacation, or do I come back and return it to you and then it goes through the Minerva system, or is that not good? Yeah, no, if you're done with it, you can leave it in Bar Harbor, um, but if you haven't, you can certainly bring it back and return it here. We're already connected to Bar Harbor, um, their library through the van delivery, um, and we have five-day pickups. Different libraries have, have more or, le or less. No one has six. Um, so we're, that infrastructure for the interlibrary loaning is already in place. So that is, yeah, that's not an issue. All right, thank you. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation of the library committee to enter into this reciprocal borrowing program for the 12 month duration of the pilot? So moved. Councilor Randall, is there a second? Councilor Gabrielson, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, Kyle. Thank, Thank you to the Library Committee. Next up is item number 122-2019, discussion of regional efforts for individuals and families seeking asylum. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Would you please come forward at this time? Seeing none. Oh, go ahead. Take your time. Your name and address or affiliation, please. Uh, Rosemary DeAngelis, Pleasantdale, South Portland. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I guess one of the things that occurs to me 
uh, has to do with Fort Williams Park. So I, I heard you speak about your pride in the um, revenue that you're generating, and actually I was just sort of horrified. Um, so I Fort Williams, um, I believe, should be a public park, and um, I have to take off my glasses so I can see my notes here. So um, with regard to asylum seekers, it's a place where many of them, refugees and asylum seekers, have <coughs> often come. And for them to have to pay for parking is really a burden. So what, what I believe you've done by your policy is to infringe upon the most marginalized populations who are least able to pay for that. So I went last summer to a, um, an event at Fort Williams that was with the Darfurian community, and there were probably 100 people from Darfur there with about 40 children. They all came in cars, and um, they had a huge area up by the children's playground where they had a big, uh, a big picnic, and they were there for approximately five hours. And then they cleaned up afterwards. The place was immaculate when they left. Um, but for every one of those cars who came in to have to spend $2 an hour for five hours is a burden. I mean, that's a burden. And, and I, think, I think an unnecessary burden. So um, Fort Williams is one of the places that we have often promoted to refugees and asylum seekers. Um, as a place where they can go, where they can bring their families, where they can gather for picnics, where they can um, take their kids onto the beach, but mostly it's where they gather for large uh, community events because they don't have any place. They live in apartments and they don't have any place where they can gather and do that. And Fort Williams is the place where they, where they do that and where they know to come to do that. So, <clears throat> When you ask what is something you can do, um, I think that you can figure out a way that you cannot infringe on this already marginalized, struggling population. Um, so I don't know. What, I don't. I don't know how you can do it. You know, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I mean, we're, you know, to to me it would be that that I wish that the community. First of all, I wish you weren't charging at all, um, and. And I think that the revenue you're generating is actually, I think it's shameful. Um, that's just my personal opinion. So if you were going to charge anybody, to me it ought to be out-of-state license plates, not main license plates. Um, this park really belongs to the state and, um, and should be afforded the opportunity for everybody in Maine to go freely. But if, you can't, if you're not willing to do that, then figure out some way, and I don't have the answer, but some way that you don't add another burden. Because of this is a place that they come multiple times during the season, and they're not even aware. I've talked to people, and they have no idea about this, because they're not following your town politics. And so they're not following um, the idea that you, that you have put to change this plan. So I would encourage you to look at that as one small thing you can do for this population because it's a park they love and they use frequently throughout the season. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others that want to speak to this item? Just a second, Caitlin. Anybody else want to speak? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Heather Dallas. I'm a former resident of Cape Elizabeth. I live in Scarborough right now. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the scope is that you were attempting to discuss about the asylum seekers, but I just want to offer up briefly what I've been doing and what my involvement has been with them for the past four and a half years. Uh, I started an organization, totally grassroots, basically me and the asylum seekers who can't work for six months. It's called Making It Home, and we collect gently used household items, including furniture, and when the people get their apartments, when they move out of the family shelter, we take that and we set them up. We completely outfit them, because as 
most of you or some of you know, they get no money to do that. There's nothing in their general assistance that even gives them an extra dollar to buy coat hangers at the dollar store. So um, it's been an amazing experience for me. We have helped over 700 people in four and a half years. It's not a business, it's just become my passion and uh, I met the first family and they happened to be from Rwanda and I've just fallen in love with them and I can't say enough about the, uh, I'm not even sure what words to use, the integrity, the compassion, the heart of these people. Uh, for those people who might want to say the, uh, you know, the old not in my backyard, if you were to spend even five minutes with these people, I just got the chills telling you this, but um, so what I would like to offer up is if people are thinking about hosting the families, uh, the thing is when you host them, you're going to fall in love with them. So they're not just going to be there. They'll become parts of your family. And if you get to the point where you're uh, helping them find their permanent housing, please feel free to reach out to me. Don't try to source their houses yourself. We all have plenty enough in our own houses, as everybody can attest. We don't use new stuff. We use gently used and they love it and it works perfectly. It's totally green instead of going to the dump or the swap shop or we use it to furnish their houses. I'd be glad to talk to anybody about my experience with the folks and uh, if people do decide they want to do that, please feel free to to uh, contact me about any of it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, Councilor Jordan? Oh, I just wanted to clarify and hopefully clarify for everybody, but we spent a lot of time on the pave and display for Fort Williams to accommodate everybody of every means, every visitor from here, there, everywhere. And the people that you describe that are going to be coming and, and wanting to have picnics in the park, well, most of them are not looking to park in the premium parking that requires you to pay for. As you said yourself, they park up by the children's garden, which is free to this day. It was free a month ago, a week ago, it's free tomorrow. It was free always, so it adds no burden on anybody to park in those designated areas that are free forever until it gets changed, but I don't think it's going to because this is what we've set into place. So just to clarify, there is still free parking at the park. There is premium pay for parking. So we tried to balance it as best we could to come up with a solution that fit everybody. Residents are free. Visitors, people from Maine can get a very reasonably priced pass. We did our very best to make this work for everybody. So I just wanted to make sure that that was put out there because there's a lot of misconceptions about what's happening at the pay and display. I want to beat that dead horse because, again, uh, the exact area you, you expressed the concern about is the exact area that remains free for parking. Anyone that wants can go to Fort Williams and park for free, and they have to walk at most 500 feet more than they would have had to park had to walk before. There's a large area. What's notable from what we're hearing about the Fort Williams parking uh, rollout is that people aren't parking up there because they find, well, the way I interpret it is that they don't find the amount onerous. Yes, there are subsets that will, and they can park up in the free area, but what I've really found enlightening is that most people are paying for parking because they don't think the walk is that, they think it's worth it. They're not gonna park 500 feet away. They're like, I'll pay the $2, the $4, rather than park 500 feet away. So again, there is a major section of the Fort Williams parking lot area that remains free and is still free. Anyone can park there. I just continue to beat that dead horse, so. Um, I wanna bring this all back to the heart of the issue though. Um, on the agenda and that is discussion of um, uh, what's happening today and, and, and what we might do as a community going forward. Um, the only point I'll make about Fort Williams and I appreciate the comments that you made is that um, just several days ago um, we had a, you know, what I thought was an amazing 
um, event uh, that one of your neighbors in South Portland was the spearhead organizer of and thank her for doing that and was so happy to see it come off as a success and was glad that the town could in a very small way uh, make that happen by uh, making the space available, uh, waiving fees, uh, and coordinating with all the organizers of that effort. So I, I think as we come back to this part of the discussion, that looking for ways to do things like that um, are how we can probably make our own contribution here. And so uh, invite the council um, uh, to be thinking about that as we get into the discussion. To do that, I'm gonna turn to Matt. Um, Matt's been sharing emails with us um, about some of the regional efforts that have been ongoing. Um, Matt, if you wanna just sort of summarize for the benefit of those here tonight and, uh, and watching. Sure, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of different areas that I'd like to touch on if I could. Uh, one is that uh, the update, inf up-to-date information that we have, we try to get onto the town website as they come. Uh, I know Councillor Gabrielson and myself have worked for the Metro Regional Coalition uh, to try, uh, we've been briefed a couple different times, uh, either via email or in person, uh, by uh, Manager Jennings and others associated with uh, responding to uh, the, the asylum seekers. And the big thing is housing, obviously, is the, is the major need that's been identified because, and, and thank you to USM and Bowdoin College to provide a bridge uh, housing, but August is coming, so a number of people will have to be out of the available housing that they have, so that has helped somewhat, but there are still, uh, from what I understand, uh, through GP Cog, there are still a number of uh, families that are in need for housing, and they have reached out to the faith communities, or the faith community in Greater Portland and through all the different areas, uh, and they're trying to work on potential for host families. So folks can, if they can, you know, home share, uh, things along those lines, or if you have an available unit, uh, there are some developers in Portland who are trying to create some space. They're looking at all ways and manners of space, commercial space that could be converted on a short-term basis into, into housing units uh, to, so folks can get situated. One of the big challenges, of course, as Ms. Dallas noted, uh, is uh, a six month requirement that uh, the asylum seekers really are, are almost held in place, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, because they can't apply for work, they can't apply for benefits, and they're just basically locked, locked down. Uh, so that's been a big challenge. But uh, some of the areas that we can help out with from an from a individual basis would be to make uh, contributions of your time. If you so need, like Preble Street Resource Center uh, could use assistance through volunteers. They can also use assistance with uh, food donations, monetary donations. We've got those links on our website if people would like to avail themselves of that. Uh, other areas that, uh, that, um, that we can agree to or find assistance in, as, as Chairman Garvin stated, you know, on the 4th of July, you know, it was a very easy request for us to, to approve the use of the picnic shelter. And uh, I think that's, you know, what we're looking at here uh, is finding any, you know, there's not one solution, there's not one answer. There's multiple little answers that may help us all move, move along. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, Another area from housing, every one of the surrounding communities or the Metro Coalition communities uh, that were involved as well as some of the other further out suburban communities have reached out to all the landlords that they have within their community. I've done the same here. Uh, one of the big challenges, surprise, is there is very low vacancy of any, any housing. So that's why they're looking at that more of a creative response. Uh, some of the areas that have been identified that may still be in need that communities uh, can reach out and help in, uh, like South Portland, for instance, a couple weeks ago, a week and a half ago, perhaps, as Ms. DeAngelis may know, uh, made a $40,000 donation to the ILAP uh, so folks can get assistance with the legal assistance that they need in pursuit of, uh, of, of, their, of their individual claims. Uh, other areas, uh, Portland Metro, for instance, has provided some uh, free or discounted uh, uh, transit. Uh, the down easter because a lot of people need to go to Boston to get processing to help them get through the, the process. Uh, so the down easter has been looking at trying to provide some some lower cost uh, fare to get down there. So uh, as well as you know some of these social service organizations, we already are on our donation list. So the town you know 
one area that maybe is, is if the town decides it might want to make a targeted donation to assist in this in this process with you know different organizations. I will say that uh, you know I know for instance St. Albans has been very active in spreading the word as well as uh, I think they were recently at a at the meeting uh, that was held at GP Cog of the faith community to try to find their assistance. So uh, I guess any kind of help uh, would be ap appreciated, but the city has, has stated certain areas that they could find it in, and uh, GP Cog has been really working through the Metro Coalition with you know, Manager Jennings and uh, Assistant Manager Heather Brown from the City of Portland to try to get that, uh, to try to get their needs identified. Uh, I guess with us, the big things that they have now is food and uh, supplies, and, but housing's the big one. Uh, but that's pretty much where we're at at this point in time. But they are moving forward and uh, they are getting a lot of help, but they can use, you know, they can use help in many different manners. So. Uh, I don't have an answer or a specific ask for what the council may need to do, but I think anything that you may feel is appropriate is, is definitely on the table. So that's that's where we're at at this point. Great, thank you for the summary. Now. Um, and I do know a lot of people in town are very actively um, undertaking efforts um, to assist in this. Um, whether it be, and I know there's some organized work on the legal services front, um, even at the recycling center, there's um, a very dedicated uh, volunteer uh, who has been, um, you know, sorting through goods that are, you know, certainly usable um, and coordinating delivery to some of the existing um, social services agencies that have been assisting in the effort. So I want to thank everybody in town that is already, um, you know, going above and beyond. Um, to help in this manner and um, uh, appreciate their efforts. Um, so again, thank you for the update, Matt. One thing that I'd like to start off by asking um, is for you to um, coordinate with um, Kathy Raftis to see if um, there's any possibility, what, what this would look like um, and, and what the viability is, if we have any potential for um, uh, programs that we're already offering through community services, and it could be for either adults or children, um, that are undersubscribed. And so we basically have openings for programs that we're already putting on to see what the possibility that would be and if there's any interest in offering any of those kinds of things up. Um, I think that's one thing that, that we could tangibly do. Um, you know, in conversations I've been having with people, um, you know, we don't we don't have places to, to put people other than, than host families, and I, I think that, that that activity is just starting to gain traction. They're developing a screening process for, um, you know, for uh, how to how to screen families. But um, for what we do have, if we can make that like we did with the fort more available to people, I think that's that's one way we can certainly pitch in a little bit. But uh, other thoughts from other councilors, Council Randall. Um. I, I think making some sort of um, large donation as a town would be a really nice gesture um, and very important and very much needed. I don't know which organization we would want to direct those funds to. There are so many different needs and maybe we could talk about that, but um, it does seem, I mean, ob obviously ILAP needs money to provide legal services, but the biggest issue is the housing piece. So wherever it would be most effective in that sense, I think would be the best approach for now. Um, the other thing I know I had mentioned when we were discussing putting this item on the agenda was um, I, I feel like there may be a way that we can use the Thomas Jordan Trust to support um, either host families in Cape Elizabeth or if asylum seekers do end up being hosted here and becoming residents to use that money to support them. So I was going to propose that we refer it to the committee to look a little bit at the options and maybe talk about whether that would be feasible for us. Further discussion? So um, I'll, I, as a general matter, uh, and it's the same position I took when I was on the Fort Williams Park Commission, I do not favor ever waiving fees for anyone. Uh, when you take a set of fees and you say, we're going to waive for this group, we're not going to waive for that group, you are in effect picking winners and losers, which from my perspective, 
the government should never be involved in doing. The government sets the fees and everyone pays the same fees. We shouldn't be picking the groups we prefer and the groups we don't prefer. It's very difficult for me to say, Someone comes in and wants to use a resource of the town, uh, like for example, the, uh, the, the um, community services. If a resident comes in and says, oh, I want to use this, and we say, okay, well, here's the fee, and then someone else comes in and says, well, I want to use this, and we say, well, for various reasons, we're going to waive it. Uh, it's one, we, we have laid out criteria where we do reduce and waive fees. We have those rules, they should be applied uniformly, the government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. It makes me concerned that our entire fee structure, uh, someone could come in and say, well, you, you waive fees for those people, you haven't waived fees for me, I'm going to sue you if you don't waive fees for me as well. It, 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 it's very worrisome to me as we begin going down that route, and I'm concerned that we would open ourselves up to such, such an allegation or attack. So for that reason, uh, the fees are what they are, we shouldn't be picking winners and losers no matter how much we might want to, nevertheless it's not our role to waive fees for one group or one person and not and apply them to other people. We have to have uniform rules, and that's the approach I would take. Other discussion? Councilor Jordan? Um, I don't necessarily disagree with um, Valerie's point about a donation of sorts and to what organization. What I, what I would add is I have felt for many, many, many years that the city of Portland has bared the brunt for social services to, uh, for vulnerable populations. And I think what the asylum seekers have done for communities um, around Portland is uh, raise awareness of what that city does every single day. And I think that what I would like to propose is that we consider um, something from a longer term perspective that says Cape Elizabeth is going to step up and say that we will stand with Portland and help take care of the people who go to that city who are homeless, who are without food, who have so many mental health issues, opioid crisis, all of this. Asylum seekers have raised that flag and I think we need that discussion. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think the response from the city of Portland in addressing this immediate situation has been phenomenal. Um, and where I think we can make a difference now is in looking at this not as a situation that the city of Portland is tasked to deal with. What I've been really impressed with at the conversations through the Metro Regional Coalition and through GPCOG is all of the surrounding communities are, are coming to the table and asking how they can help with this. Uh, this is not something that the city of Portland budgeted for. Uh, they, they do provide a lot of social services for a large portion of the state, um, and this is just on top of that. I think the other structural issue that this has highlighted is just simply the housing shortage in our region. Um, finding available housing is the biggest situation. From, from my understanding of where the city of Portland and the state and other uh, nonprofits in responding to this particular situation is, is this is something that came on quickly, but it's not a situation that's going to resolve quickly. Even once these individuals get all of them into the asylum process, it's gonna be a long period of time. Um, and I would support uh, this council making a contribution either directly to the city of Portland to help them reimburse them for some of the costs that they've taken on on behalf of our region or to one of the other nonprofit agencies, um, Preble Street, um, the Immigrant Legal Aid Project, um, and a number of others um, that have really stepped up. Uh, it was really um, heartwarming 
to attend some of the initial meetings and hear just some of the many, many ways that different organizations have stepped up to deal with this immediate situation, down to, you know, main bed taking on the extra laundry for, for bedding materials that needed to be washed somewhere and the city didn't have a place to do it. Um, and I think we can, we can help make a difference in alleviating that burden for our neighbors. Other discussion? Matt, you sure. something? Yeah, uh, one, one area that, uh, speaking with Christina Egan from GP Cog today, she identified was the transportation area. Maybe it's something that if we wanted to run, uh, if, if there was a donation, we could have that, uh, I guess Cog could allocate those funds and make sure that that was purchased or there may be a conduit to which, to which to run that, you know, because they could purchase the Downeaster tickets or Metro, uh, you know, Portland Metro bus tickets or what have you to help folks uh, get to where they need to be, and that may be a that may be an option. Transportation was one area that specifically she had said. Now and and of course, food, uh, you know, the, something to Preble Street would be uh, well used. And the other area of discussion that we had at the Metro Regional side was uh, with Belinda Ray from the City of Portland. Was you know, there's 200 asylum seekers, but they already had an additional 500. The homeless people who they're trying to, to place as well. It's, you know, it's just above and beyond the existing problem that, that was there. So, uh, as Councilor Gabrielson said, it's uh, you know, it's acute and it came on fast on one section, but they already had an existing issue, as Councilor Jordan noted as well. So, yeah. they've got a lot of irons in the fire. I, I see Chris's hand up, but if I could, real briefly, I think one other area where we may be able to help um, too is. Uh, GP Cog has really stepped up um, on behalf of municipalities in providing a lot of coordination services around host family placements and other things. And one small way that we may be able to help is um, we already are a member of, of the Cog, but helping them with some of the staff costs associated with that. Uh, so uh, I, I really liked uh, Matt and Penny's comments, and it goes to the, goes to the core of kind of my prior comment, which I don't like us picking winners and losers and saying this group we're going to give resources to and other groups that have been suffering for years, we're just going to continue to ignore you. Um, so I wanted, uh, we currently donate some to uh, Preble Street, is that correct? Yes. So I, did, I really wanted to explore Penny's comment about uh, have we been um, carrying our fair share with Preble Street? And I would be more open to something if we look at we haven't been carrying our fair share, if, if we can somehow put that together and say, if we divert more to help with the overall problem, because at the crest, of the, there, there's a housing crisis, and there are a lot of people suffering because of the housing crisis. As you may know, through the grapevine, there's some people in town that are in looking for, there's, there's a housing situation going on in town as well. So there, it, it's a larger issue. I'd rather focus it uh, by diverting resources to an, uh, an entity that helps out everyone uniformly as opposed to picking winners and losers and diverting resources only to one small subset rather than a number of other people who are in a similar situation. So Councilor Deborah. Just, just to clarify, are you thinking um, money to Portland and then Portland would decide? It, or are you thinking... What are you uh, uh, I would need the information first, but to the extent that it's that uh, Penny noted, oh, she, it, and I'd like to hear from her, where she feels like we may not have been shouldering mm -hmm. our fair share of the burden with, and I assume the way that we traditionally have handled that is Preble Street, but I'm somewhat, by, by, but so I, I'd love to hear what from I, Penny if she has any suggestions. What, what I... Um, what I think about, what I see, what I have uh, experienced in working with uh, uh, different groups of people, and um, and watching the pressure on the social services in Portland for years and years, uh, and yes, when you have an influx of people, it just it really magnifies an issue that already existed. And that's why I go, why don't we talk about the issue that already existed where the city of Portland is, uh, gets reduced dollars for general assistance and has to come up with tax dollars in order to have enough general assistance to address the issues of the population in, in the city. What we have 
uh, clinics in in Portland that uh, you know doctors volunteer, and they're wonderful clinics. We have um, so many different mental health services that are are funded through the city of Portland. We've sat here for years. And that problem has existed for the last 20 or 30 years of buses of people coming into the city of Portland because of the services they provide. And we, got, we think our tax dollars that we pay um, uh, are helping to fund that when the city of Portland pays the brunt for the services that are supplied to all of these populations. And, and I mean, when I think about the housing crisis, that housing crisis has existed for years. It's like, what? and I know I've worked with people who are dealing with uh, uh, the homeless population, and for these people to get housing and the daunting task that they have to go through in order to get there is, is would make anybody so frustrated that they stay on the streets. Um, and so I asked the question of, why don't we go back to, if we're talking about a housing crisis, why don't we go back to World War II when we put up a hell of a lot of houses in a short period of time? Um, you've got spaces like the, you know, I'm gonna just say the old GE plant, you've got spaces out there where you could put up houses like that. But instead we try to use a bureaucracy of, of HUD and all of these things and all of this funding versus saying, okay, let's step back and fix the housing crisis. Uh, those are the things that are frustrating me, and I say that, and I thank these asylum seekers for coming to Portland because they have now highlighted the issues, and we as a community need to solve the problem. It's not Portland's problem anymore, and it can't, two years from now, we should still be helping Portland solve that problem. We should be getting people off the streets. We should be ensuring that kids are safe. We should be ensuring all of these things as a community. And uh, sometimes I live in my little bubble, and, uh, and then when I go to Portland, I see the, the things that uh, I, I worked with for many years when I, in social work. Uh, but we gotta fix the problem. And I think we give money to, I think, the city of Portland to determine where is the best place to spend it at this point in time because they are at a breaking point. And then we step back and say, what are we now gonna do on an ongoing basis to help the city of Portland ensure that people have a roof over their head, food on the table, health care, and all of those things, so. Other discussion? Matt, did you wanna um, highlight a couple of organizations? One other organization that you, that you currently contribute to also is the Opportunity Alliance, which is kind of you know the, the amalgamation of Provincy Resource Center and they have different programs, early childhood development, housing and energy services, community initiatives, as well as specific response towards the crisis. That may check a lot of boxes that you're looking at uh, right now, if you, you, mm -hmm. you know, depending upon what you'd like to do in the, uh, you know, in the short term and you could work, work with them. We are, and I just received, uh, I sent them confirmation that they were on our list for the new fiscal year. Uh, as far as uh, social service agencies through the town uh, provides uh, support to. But they also are specific for crisis support as well. Uh, but there's a lot of different avenues that that might, you know, in the interim, do that. But then I think the larger discussion that, as Council Jordan said, I mean, you, I think there are other areas that you may want to think about in, in subsequent budgets as well uh, in order to respond. But. Uh, I think, don't have those answers tonight on that side. I think the city, I, and I'm sure you guys have had this conversation um, um, with the meetings, the coalition you've gone to. What is it that how can we continue as a set of communities to work on this problem and keep it in 
the forefront. Don't keep it in the, the back room any longer. Bring it out, say it all the time. Bring an update that says, here's what we're doing now as a set of communities in uh, greater Portland. We, we do have, and, and <laughs> previews of coming attractions, Council George, uh, <laughs> and I believe it'll be either, probably on September's agenda, will be an item uh, specific to the Housing First uh, model that they're looking at. It's a, it's a very active agenda item on the Metro Regional as well as GPCOG uh, plate uh, as far as the housing I'd say crisis it's, it's, it's not an underused term or a, an inappropriate one, uh, but you'll be seeing something along those lines as well for all the communities who are in the metro regional and looking at that as, a, as of utmost importance. So to try to find ways to provide affordable housing, uh, that workforce housing, things along those lines that every community can try to develop just to deal with our existing problem, yeah. In your committee meetings, maybe you could pose the question of how long did it take to build Red Bank? How long did it take to build Elizabeth Park? Sure. What did those serve during that time? That created housing at a critical point in time. And I think people have to start thinking that way. Uh, instead, if we keep churning on this housing crisis, uh, Let's solve the problem. We did it back in the 40s. Other comments, discussion? I really um, think it's important that we follow up on Council Randall's idea um, about the Thomas Jordan Trust. Um, specifically, again, coming back to the, the main point of if, um, if our Part of, if part of how we're going to help in this situation is with families that are in this community, you know, we're, I hear what you're saying, Penny, about the, about the macro size of the problem, but as it relates to the here and now and what, what people in this community are able to do right now, um, home shares and, and um, hosting, you know, serving as a host family um, seem like an, an actionable and, and uh, immediate way that, um, that people are going to be able to help out. So how we can best facilitate that, and you know, for some people in this community, it, it won't be any burden on them whatsoever. Um, there might be others who are very, um, you know, philanthropically inclined in that manner, but um, you know, for which contribution from the Thomas Jordan Trust, if that's viable, um, would make that all all the more reasonable for them. So um, I think that's definitely something that we should do, and um, as we continue to get information about. Um, what the process is going to be for um, people that are interested in applying to be host families. Um, we'll communicate that out to the citizens in town, make them as aware as quickly as we can uh, so that they can take action on applying um, to do that. So I, I don't know when the next meeting, uh, I know that we scheduled them r rather as on needed. an ad, ad hoc and as needed basis, but I think it would be worth scheduling a meeting of the Thomas Jordan Trust Committee um, so that we can uh, have that discussion and, and look into the details on, on based on the, the way the trust is constructed, um, you know, what latitude exists there. Go ahead, Bay. I understand near term and long term, and I, and I apologize that I always go to that more macro level, but I, I really see that um, uh, present problems are the seed to solve the bigger issues. And if you take and you use those seeds properly, you can solve many, many problems. And so, I guess that's my farmer analogy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sow the seeds and we can create a better community. So. Yes, Caitlin Jordan. I, I don't want to sound like the cold-hearted person up here, but... I, going on with what Chris has been saying about picking the winners and losers, I, I don't want to see us changing the Thomas Jordan Trust to pick winners and losers. That trust was set up a long time ago for a reason, and it's specifically set up a way it, it is so that it will last. I just don't want to see us picking winners and losers so that that trust gets drained down to nothing in a year. Because that's very possible to be happy to, with what you guys are kind of talking about. There are so many resources needed that you you start stretching 
the language or the latitude that you, you say makes me nervous about what you could do to that trust. That's all. Um, just out of curiosity, are, are we looking to take an action tonight, or are we looking to have, an, have a discussion that we would take action Anything's on, on the table. The, the, the only main point was to have a discussion. You know, the, the timing of our meeting calendar has been such that um, since this uh, really came to the forefront, our, our meeting in June was literally like two days um, after uh, the, the largest wave of, of folks had arrived in Portland, and this is really our first meeting opportunity since then. So. So, so my understanding from the meetings with the Metro Regional Coalition is that the um, additional costs that this current situation has placed on the city of Portland are in the magnitude of several hundred thousand dollars over the course of the six months or so that people won't be able to work. Um, and so what I would propose just for the purpose of discussion is uh, it sounds like there's three things that we, people have talked about that we could look at doing. Um, I think one would be a, a financial contribution to the city of Portland to help them defray some of the costs that they've already incurred and will incur. Um, I think um, I would like to ask the town manager to talk with um, GP Cog um, about pulling together a budget on what additional costs they're incurring to help coordinate some of the host's family efforts and um, that we could consider in, in August or September to help them for some of that regional coordination effort. Um, defraying those staff costs. And um, then the third item seems to be um, taking a look at what, or, or referring to the Thomas um, Jordan. Uh, Jordan Fund uh, Committee to take a look at what options might be available under, under that. GP COG is an organization staffed I couldn't support dollars to defray costs of an organization that is not doing direct care and direct service. Um, that is where the money needs to go, is direct service. Otherwise, we're funding a bureaucracy, and that's where too many of our dollars go from a social service perspective. So I can support money going to direct service, but I cannot support money going to an organization that um, is a bureaucracy. I think the direction from, the, at least from what I've seen from the manager in, in the city of Portland and, and um, some of the other folks that are, are out in front and leading on this is um, work through the existing social services infrastructures that are in place. Um, oh, I agree. Yeah, so... But they do direct service. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm, okay, I'm, okay. I'm, Are you agreeing with I'm me? Under, yeah, <laughs> I'm... Yeah, I'm... Um, and, and no, I'm, what I'm saying is that that's, that's the direction that, you know, John Jennings and others are giving. Yeah. You know, that, you, you know, yes, if you want to donate to Portland, that's great. They're not going to turn that away. But um, that these other organizations, United Way of Greater Portland, Opportunity Alliance, Preble Street, all, all the like are the ones that are out in front delivering services and that those are the, those are the places that resources should be directed Good. on a prioritization basis. That's what I've seen. So. And I just want to front, Kate, I totally hear what you're saying on the trust. I'm not, I, I'm not saying to just, you know, A, draw it down or B, uh, be foolhardy with it. Uh, I'm interested to, to see what's possible. Same thing on my other suggestion about community services. I, I'm not saying start signing people up tomorrow. I'm just saying let's look into it. Let's see see what's what opportunity is there. I think I think the point that Council Randall made on um, wh where I see the spirit of the trust being applied is if there's a Kate family in need to deliver whatever service they're going to provide to these people that you know so that I, th I think that's the connection that I was making there but I, I, I'm not saying that it's a the best idea and best use of those funds or B that it's even if you if you look at the details fully permissible so I just, I just think it's worth looking into though so I didn't want you to misconstrue my 
point on that. Uh, Council Devereaux. I, I wonder if there's some smaller things we can do also, like for instance, um, at the transfer station, you know how we have bins for Salvation Army. Is there something we can do that, uh, where people can go and drop off clothes? Some sort of a bin, something instead of Salvation Army that would go to um, making it home or, or an organization where it's just for the asylum seekers or um, homeless people. It's for people in need that way to where we could do smaller things where people in the community could come and drop off um, furniture or donations that way. They say, hey, we want this to go to the, to, um, the homeless or the asylum seekers. Is there something we can do that way? Um, so I would say just in terms of the here and now, as it relates to the asylum seekers, it, there is somebody there very actively coordinating and going through materials that are coming in. It, um, I'm amazed at the level of effort that this woman is putting in. Um, the other thing I would say is I'd caution on redirecting from those other services you just talked about, because number one, they have a tremendous infrastructure already in place to distribute those goods, and number two, places like Goodwill, places like the Salvation Army, even if the material themselves are not going to that specific end user, it's funding programs that, that also provide services in the region. So um, it, it, just because it doesn't, it's not a box that says this is going down to the expo to help XYZ group um, doesn't mean that something that goes to the Salvation Army doesn't have benefit to the community either. But um, my, my main point, though, is that um, this one particular woman in town who's a longstanding volunteer at the recycling center and at the swap shop um, has been coordinating, taking van loads of stuff, sorting through material, um, and, and very actively working on that front. So I think we should continue to applaud her for her efforts, which are just remarkable in my eyes, um, and encourage people to take advantage of that. So, Go ahead. Um, um, looking back at the discussion that, that the Councilor Gabriel said and I were both a part to, it, Manager Jennings was there and talking about the needs that they had immediately. Um, one wasn't, uh, you know, quite frankly, donating to the City of Portland because they. Uh, you know, they've been receiving quite a bit of funds. And at that point, they'd received somewhere around three hundred and fifty thousand dollars through online, online, and then it's almost you know, doubled since. Yeah, then. yeah, it may have doubled since. And so, from all over the country, folks have been making donations there. Uh, they're also looking legislatively to find if they can uh, get the Governor Mills to advance the concept, uh, reversing uh, the previous concept from Governor LePage as far as application of general assistance funds to uh, to asylum seekers. So they're working on that on the legislative side of it. The one area that he did, uh, I would say, was most strident in, in advancing was to support social service agencies that. That are that are specifically doing it, and that's that has been, you know, that, and then the transportation areas have been the two areas that have been identified the most in the near term for for, for a need, uh, just just to help advance. If, if the council is trying to think of a direction to go in, that would be probably the most useful at this at this point in time, uh, if you were so inclined. Stuart, so we're talking like we need a number. We need you to prepare a number of what we could give to Preble Street or our Opportunity Alliance, those type of services you're talking about, or the transportation concept. So I think something needs to be presented, I guess, to us. I guess that would be our request. Our takeaway from this yeah. long discussion would be that we need some numbers prepared as to what the town could offer, I guess, is the way to put it. Not right now. <laughs> and uh, to add on to that, what I would find very persuasive, or what I would find persuasive is I, uh, I don't want to give you like this massive amount yeah. of work to do, um, but nevertheless, to the extent that it's easy to determine um, what percentage of the various municipalities in the, let's just use GPCOG as an example, uh, for the various GPCOG members, what percentage of their overall municipal budgets are they contributing to these various social services entities, and have we been meeting our fair share of that obligation? And to the extent we haven't, that I, I, I would really like to know that information. But again, I realize that might be a lot of work. So. It's, that's, a, that's an easy discussion with a number of our surrounding communities, because we, I mean, 
everybody does to certain levels. Some communities do more than others in certain areas, while yep. others, I mean, we may have, let's say, 15 agencies on our list, whereas another town might have five on their list, but they give them an equivalent amount of funding. So uh, and other towns are very uh, frugal when it comes to that. So uh, that's something I have good relationships with uh, our surrounding managers. I can get a lot of that <coughs> fairly quick. They, you know, it's cut and paste over to me, and I'd be happy to get that. And uh, what I can do is reach out to a couple of different social service agencies and come back in August, if that would be fine to do an ask, unless you want to do something now. I think any number that you quite frankly choose would be, uh, would work uh, as a thought. I mean, it's just a question of, I, I, I can find it. Uh, but I could probably come back with a more accurate number in August for action if you wanted me to have it as a specific number. And then we could have the opportunity to, to get the Jordan Trust trustees together and the, in the short term as well to, to have that discussion to see where we need to go. Because it's like three balls that are currently in the air, but, but we, can, we can handle them. Okay. Do we need motions for these things? No, I think so. I've taken down a lot of direction, so. I feel, sorry. I feel a bit uncomfortable not doing something here tonight. Um, and and the thing is, is that I, on a relative scale, I, I don't have a, a, a number of, uh, that people might feel is palatable. And I agree, Opportunity Alliance is a wonderful organization. Preble Street is a fantastic organization. There's also an organization, a health organization, that um, addresses the needs of the, uh, of the asylum seekers and other populations. Um, so what I, what I might propose is that do we take and and say that our first out of the shoot is to say because Preble Street is having to do more and more and more meals all the time, and uh, they I know they get a lot of volunteers, but there's also they don't get all their food for free. Uh, they have to pay for some of that, um, and so do we say um, do we propose that let's say five thousand dollars? to Preble Street Resource Center and $5,000 to Opportunity Alliance and say that those are some numbers out of the chute. And then we step back and we say, now what do we want our long-term strategy to be for various organizations in Portland? Because I, when I look at our budget and what we give to organizations in Portland, it's sad for Cape Elizabeth to give the amount that they give. So, Had I moved to the end of your statement, I would second it. What? I said if you add I moved to the end of your statement. You and I moved that. And I'll second it. Okay. Okay, we've got a motion on the floor. Council Caitlin Jordan is seconded. Uh, motion to allocate uh, charitable donations of $5,000 apiece to the Opportunity Alliance and to Preble Street. Is there a discussion on the motion? Um, would this come from the unassigned fund balance? Is that what we're talking I about? I thought you were writing a check. <laughs> <laughs> Jordy Farms. <laughs> no, I'm putting up housing there. To be brief, the answer would be yes. If, okay. if, 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 uh, if Councilor Jordan would add that as part of her motion. What? I'm sorry. The, oh, the uh, uh, fund balance. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I add that. Thank you. Other discussion? Councilor Rand. I think that sounds like a great idea, and I also love the idea of revisiting the discussion about a long-term commitment to social services. And I love how Penny always goes big picture. <laughs> uh, so which were the two entities? Opportunity Alliance and Preble Street. Okay. In, uh, so I can find the Opportunity Alliance in our current budget. Preble Street, does that show up under a different title? I'm just no, it's, a, it's actually part of the Oppor Opportunity Alliance. But you can specifically earmark it towards that. Is kind of what I was 
kind of the way I was running with it. So our current donations fall for Opportunity Alliance and Preble Street fall under one line item? Yeah, I think it's $1,400 this year is what Preble we had Street's in there. programming is under the Opportunity Alliance umbrella. Got it. Yeah. So let me... But when you, when you donate to Opportunity Alliance, you can specifically designate how, how funds are intended to be used. So if I'm reading this correctly, in 2017, we donated 1326, and then our budget for 2020 was 1400. Yeah. So in the three year period, we increased our budget, if those numbers are correct, a whopping $74. Most of it, yeah, most of it's <laughs> been like 2% per year is what the, Two per the trend has been. So right. I'm not sure what the number started at originally, but uh, you'll notice that there's a whole listing of them. I think there's like, yeah, 14 or so agencies, 12 or 14 agencies that are all in that range. Some are larger. Uh, Maine Community Health, which is a mental health program. I think we, I think they're around the 3,800 range is what we do for there. So there's different numbers that have been used and, and the council's voted on those for years, but they have been increased uh, from, where they, from where they started. So if you take out general assistance, it's roughly 24,000 last year across all of these various human service categories. So you said it was Opportunity Alliance and uh, Preble Street for 10,000 in total. It was five specific to Preble and five to Opportunity Alliance. And both of those are focused specifically, or both of those are generally focused on serving uh, the homeless population of Correct. the greater Portland area. Yes. It, it, it's a, uh, sorry for all these questions. Opportunity Alliance, and I'm familiar with Preble Street, but specifically what's Opportunity Alliance? If, can anyone give me exact definition of what it is for? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll take it from their mission statement off their website. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, the Opportunity Alliance works with people to build better lives, stronger communities, to provide advocacy, leadership, and support to identify the goals and address the needs of individuals, families, and communities. They envision contributing meaningfully to a community in which families and individuals are thriving and supported as they pursue their aspirations for a better life. Within the Opportunity Alliance, there is a shared belief that positive change is possible. Um, so then there's a whole cascading of different programs that they, that they provide for. Do the for. cascading of programs. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Just takes a click, Councilor Jordan. <laughs> um, they do early childhood education, housing and energy services, community initiatives, adult mental health services, children and youth mental health services, family and community support. Uh, the areas that they, they work on. They particularly place a high value on services and supports that empower individuals and families to connect with natural and community supports. Uh, let's see, under adult mental health services, for instance, they have a behavioral health home. Uh, it's a partnership between community support services uh, and uh, community mental health programming. Uh, they have peer wellness programming. They have the Women's Project, which serves women 18 and older pregnant or parenting a child up to age six. Uh, there's residential treatment programs uh, and different areas that they, that they would put that fund to, to use that could apply to all different communities. So, so I'm almost there, so just, <laughs> I apologize, bear with me. Uh, so are, is there a competitive, these, uh, Preble Street's the only one you ever hear about. Is there a competing equivalent nonprofit service uh, or is, I've always assumed they're the only game in town, but. Um, in, in other words, we're, we're picking, oh, we're going to give it to these two entities. Is there anyone else we should be considering, or is it, or these are the only two games? Preble the Street's game. a good opportunity. Uh, there's also Good Shepherd, uh, which is primarily housed in Auburn, but they have uh, some operations in Portland as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, Preble Street is really on the tip of the spear, for yeah. lack of a better term. Right. I would say that there's a couple of other agencies, and I don't know their names off the top of my head, but that, that take, um, that focus on um, um, medical health care services. I, I think we need to look at, look at that because we look at the, the whole person. Um, Opportunity Alliance is dealing with some mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, there's, um, legal aid that people will need. So I think out of the shoot, we say, let's 
direct some dollars here, but on a long-term basis, let's look at what are the types of services that we want Cape Elizabeth to be uh, funding that will ensure the ongoing health and um, from a mental, physical, and uh, I would say emotional perspective. And there's many services in Portland. What I like is ones that you can work with that um, hit a lot of different um, service needs, so. Other discussion? So, so, so final point on, then on all of this is, <laughs> so um, to wrap it up, so you sold me, uh, I, I loved, it, it's, uh, you did, I, I really love the points you made tonight. Um, uh, the key aspect for me is framing it not in the sense of we're giving it to this one particular group, uh, having ignored these other groups for the last mm -hmm. decade. Exactly. Looking at it instead from the perspective of um, we've been increasing at 2% per year as there's been a uh, housing crisis going on in the greater Portland area and people in need instead being a we're going to pay it back for um, we should have been giving more over the last couple of years. So that's the frame of mind that I'm in to justify it and we're giving it to an, enti an entity that we historically have supported as an attempt to uh, shoulder our share of the burden of the, the crisis in the greater Portland area. Not for this group in particular, but for all of the, the greater community. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other discussion? Seeing none, motion on the table is to allocate a uh, total of $10,000 uh, from the unassigned fund balance to uh, the organization's Opportunity Alliance and Preble Street specifically. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. You. Um, I think just to conclude on this, the takeaways for the non-donation things, um, we'll leave to Matt to uh, pursue some of the questions that were brought up tonight and report back to us on what opportunities exist um, on top of what we've already talked about. So. Um, We'll move on to item number 123-2019, amendment and extension of the lease to the Portland Water District for wastewater treatment facility on Spurwick Avenue. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, Matt, can you give us a quick overview? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as many of you are aware, we have a wastewater treatment facility located on Spurwink Avenue. It is currently on leased land from the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, but they are looking to do some improvements on the site. Uh, to help uh, the long-term needs of the facility, uh, part of which is uh, they need to have their lease extended because they're looking to do some financing. So if they know that they're going to have at least the ground that they are located on secure for the term of the note, the lending institution would be happy to lend them that money knowing that they are, are secure. Uh, also, uh, they needed to add a, 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 mendis, uh, a little bit of land area to that. Uh, to add to that lease, and so that language is there as well for that. Um, this would be extending of the lease an additional 30 years uh, to, to May 1st of 2055, at which point I think I will be retired, so we won't have to do another extension of the lease. However, uh, we are looking for that this evening. Uh, the lease has been reviewed by Mike Hill, our attorney, and uh, he's found it to be all in line, as well as the Portland Water District Board of Trustees will uh, vote on this at their August meeting if the council so chooses to, to amend this this evening. And the other area that is, is that uh, the, up, the amount of the, of the annual lease has been updated to reflect the more current terms, although it's still, you know, changing it from $2,200 to $4,000, but the one area that we were adding is to increase it by 2% annually, because it, from the original time, it pretty much stayed stagnant all the way through those term periods. So uh, the water district has looked at this, and they're completely in support of it as well, and in agreement. So uh, what we need this evening is uh, council action to uh, amend the lease and extend it for that time period. Thank you for that overview. Uh, is there a motion to extend the lease? As just presented by Matt. So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan. 
Any discussion? Councilor Jordan? Just a question, make sure I read the lease right. The money goes into the Thomas Jordan Fund. Thank you, yes, that, that was the last point I had. Thank you for that, Councilor Jordan. Yes, that, the funding from that, because it is on the land that was considered previously as the poor farm, uh, the funds that do come from that do go directly to the Thomas Jordan Trust. Um, I'm just, uh, uh, thank you, um, curious as on the thoughts for, for adjusting it, I, I noted in the Portland Water District minutes that, that the discussion to their board of trustees was that these funds are then just charged back to the ratepayers. Yeah. Um, and so I was just curious as a ratepayer <laughs> um, what, the, what the thought was in adjusting the, um, the lease amount. It was a good opportunity, quite frankly, to, to adjust it. Looking at the last number, which is fairly arbitrarily selected, but felt that it's a good way to help contribute and grow to that grow to that fund, uh, where otherwise there are very limited means for, for income to come into that uh, fund as well, outside of just growth on the current investment. And help the land pay for the goals of what the Thomas Jordan Trust had as well. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Is there anybody here remaining that wishes to speak to something that was not covered on tonight's agenda? No? All right, if there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, all those in favor? All right, thank you very much, good night. <laughs>